So, yeah, as a partner uh, mentioned, um, a farm advisor on the Central Coast, and I have the opportunity to specialize in irrigation water resource management. And so uh, this will be sort of a general talk, uh, trying to put in, uh, you know, I guess the best tips I have on, on improving irrigation efficiency, particularly for uh, drip irrigated row crops, you know, mostly vegetables and berries. But a lot of what I'll talk about will apply to uh, tree crops and other types of irrigation systems. <clears throat> so I thought I'd just begin by sort of defining what, how I see uh, irrigation efficiency, because everyone has slightly different uh, definitions. But it's basically a comparison of the volume of water you apply uh, to your crop to the volume of water actually required by the crop to meet what we call uh, consumptive use or, or the irrigation requirement. And the consumptive use of the crop is water needed for evapotranspiration. So water loss through the leaves and evaporation from the soil, that's evapotranspiration. Salinity control, if you have uh, issues with salt management, um, maybe you load your, your soil with salt just from the water or you have existing salinity, so you need some leaching. So that's uh, uh, part of the irrigation requirement. And then in some cases, you're doing climate modification, um, essentially cooling the crop by irrigating or uh, in some cases, frost protection. Um, and so just as an example, you know, if you figured out the irrigation requirement uh, for your crop was 13 inches and you're applying say 15 inches, uh, you essentially divide the irrigation requirement by the applied water to come up with an irrigation efficiency. In this case, it's a pretty good one, 87%. And so if you're applying exactly the amount of water that the crop needs, you'd have a perfect efficiency. So some of the benefits of getting to a high irrigation efficiency, the first one um, is that you maximize the, the yield of your crop and the quality, but there's also these other benefits that you can conserve water. Uh, if you're trying to put fertilizer through your drip system, you fertigate more uniformly. Uh, you minimize nutrient losses through leaching, such as nitrate leaching and ultimately save money. So there's real, really three facets to achieving a high irrigation efficiency. The first starts with uh, designing your system correctly uh, so that the irrigation system applies water uniformly to the crop. And we call that a high application uniformity or some people a high uh, distribution uniform. The second part is operating the system and maintaining it correctly so that you can maximize your potential application uniformity of the irrigation system. So you might have a great design, but if it's not operated right, you won't uh, achieve the potential uniformity that you should from based on the design. And then lastly is scheduling the irrigations uh, to match the applied water uh, needs of the crop. Uh, so the, that's the irrigation requirement, but the irrigation requirement changes all the time through the season as that crop grows. And so you need to irrigate at the right time and put the right amount on. Uh, if you have a perfectly uniform system in terms of application, but you get the scheduling off, uh, you won't have a high irrigation efficiency. Either you're going to uh, over irrigate or you're going to reduce uh, the yield because you're not putting the water on when the crop needs and maybe you stress it. So I'd like to um, just start by saying, you know, one way you can assess your irrigation system is just get out there in the field and watch it while it's operating. 
And often you can identify problems like in here, you can see all the leaks, um, but there could be other problems that you see. Uh, you might see uh, maybe that uh, when you turn off the irrigation system, a lot of the water just drains to the lowest area of the field and it's always wet there. You could see valves leaking. So uh, just getting out there and uh, walking around the field when it's operating is very useful. And I'll talk later about uh, pressure monitoring, but that's also a useful thing you can do while the system's operating. And when you're at the design phase of a system, an irrigation system, you always have to think about what is the appropriate filtration to use for your water quality. And so for drip, it's really important that you don't plug up those drip emitters and really assess the water quality. So if you're pulling well water, uh, usually a screen filter will work. Um, but if you are using water from, let's say, a canal uh, that might have algae or the water goes into um, a reservoir and you can get some biological material, then you'll need something like a sand media filter or a disc filter. So you also want to look at what is the filtration requirement of the drip tape or the drip emitters that you're using. So different uh, emitters have, have different filtration uh, requirements and I talk about uh, different meshes on the filters. If you want to get uh, more specific about um, how well your system is operating, you can uh, conduct what we call a application uniformity um, evaluation or distribution uniformity evaluation. Uh, and this involves some very simple tools and we just use these little Tupperware, uh, little, uh, I guess, cups uh, that you would use, you know, to put your sandwiches in. And we isolate emitters on the drip tape. And this is, works for surface drip, it can work for, um, you know, in, if you were using uh, emitters on say a vineyard or something like that, uh, you could do it too that way. Um, and we even uh, do berry drip. We have to dig up the tape to stick this under. But we isolate the emitters with some uh, pieces of hoses um, that we cut on each side and put it on, the, uh, um, on each side of the emitter and uh, just measure the volume of water that's discharged from each of these emitters over a 10 or 15 minute period. And so you have to do this at many different locations in the field. And typically we'll do maybe eight emitters uh, close together in one area and then go to another location, do another eight or 10 emitters. And so once you get maybe 30 or more emitters evaluated, you can evaluate um, or calculate what we call the uh, distribution uniformity of the lowest quarter or the driest quarter. And so you uh, measure the volumes of each of these emitters, right? And identify the 25% of them that have the least amount of water, take the average of that volume from all those emitters and divide it by the average of the volume that's discharged from all the emitters. So, uh, so for example, if uh, you found 300 milliliters was the average that you were measuring um, for, the, for the lowest 25% and 400, was the number you got for the average for all of the emitters, then you'd have a, a lowest quarter uniformity of 75%. So 300 divided by 400, and then you multiply it by 100. So um, that's a, just sort of an overall um, synopsis of how we do those uh, uniformity evaluations. And if you're interested, I, I do have protocols on, on um, how to, do this for drip and other types of irrigation systems. So with drip, pressure management is really key to achieving a high application uniformity. And uh, remember, a high application uniform is needed uh, to get to a high irrigation efficiency. <clears throat> and I wanted to illustrate why this is true. Um, 
So this graph shows the pressure in drip tape from zero to 10 PSI and the discharge rate of the emitters. And it's in units of gallons per minute per 100 feet length of tape. And so we often talk about medium flow tape being about at 0.4 or 0.45. Uh, and high flow at 0.6, and low flow at maybe 0.3. Uh, but you can see that the tape is able to output uh, different amounts of water depending on the pressure. Um, and so if you're operating the tape at the correct pressure under this tape, you'd just be above 0.6 uh, gallons uh, per minute per 100 feet. Uh, but if you had areas of the field that are at lower pressure, say at two PSI, then you're only putting out 0.4 gallons per minute per 100 feet, which is about 34% less water applied to those areas. And so you can see how uh, the tape can be very sensitive to fluctuations in pressure or uh, differences in pressure in different areas of the field. And so that's what you're trying to do is operate these systems have to have a consistent pressure throughout the irrigation and have a design that uh, has similar pressure throughout the field. So some of the factors that increase pressure variation, one being elevation change, um, undersizing fittings and, and the pipe for the flow rates that you might have, or having the drip lines you know, too long for the discharge rate of the tape, and uh, which consequently causes very high flow rates. So you have to get all these things right in the design uh, phase uh, so you don't have excessive pressure variation. So if you aren't familiar with this number, 2.3 feet, um, that's the uh, change in elevation that causes a change of one PSI in your drip system. So if you had a 23 foot elevation change from one end of the field to another, that would be a 10 PSI difference in your drip system, which is quite a lot, right? So you would have to design that system to manage that um, pressure variation. Then the other place you can get uh, uh, some pressure variation is if you undersize uh, the mains or the submains for the flow rate of um, that you have in your system. So this um, table is just showing you different diameters of pipe from one and a half to six inches in diameter. And that's on the uh, vertical axis there. And then the um, along the top are different flow rates. And so, uh, in the table, you can see how much pressure is lost per 100 feet of length of that pipe. So if we were running, um, you know, 50 gallons per minute through a two inch pipe, every 100 feet, you would lose about three PSI. And then if you tried to force 75 feet or 75 gallons per minute through that pipe, uh, you'd lose seven. And so you get, you can see as you get to higher and higher flow rates, you have more and more pressure loss. Uh, so selecting the right diameter, whether it's lay flat uh, or PVC pipe, and even drip tape, right? Uh, if you have too much flow through the drip system, uh, the drip tape, uh, for the diameter of that drip tape, it's going to have also have pressure loss. And also, we often see that, um, you know, the right at the, uh, what we call the header or at the, the main to submain connections, there could be lots of parts that an irrigator will put in there uh, that creates pressure loss. And that's because you get turbulence as the water flows through all of those different little pieces. And especially if they're undersized, it causes uh, quite a bit of pressure loss. And so, for example, in this field on one side at, on the main line, we had um, you know 12 psi, but when we get to the uh, drip system there, 
it's down at like five PSI. And that's because just going through that, all those little parts there uh, caused enough turbulence and they were undersized. And so we had a lot of pressure loss. So just removing all that, increasing di diameter, uh, uh, corrected that problem. Now, this is an example of a field with drip uh, that has very long lengths of beds. And this grower is using 7 8 tape. But if you were going to use, say, 5 8 tape, that might be a diameter that's too narrow for the discharge rate of that tape. And then you'd get problems with um, the pressure being much higher at the head of the field or the upper part of the field compared to the lower. Excuse me, I'm in a seminar. Yeah, just, just see. Yeah, just see. Yeah, just see. Yeah, just see. Sorry. <laughs> My boss wanted to talk to me. <laughs> uh, so uh, where I was headed here was just selecting the right tape for the length of the field, the diameter is, is really important. So another way to understand, you know, if you have a lot of pressure variation in your system is just monitoring it. And you start right at the water source, you know, um, at the pump and on both sides of the filter that can identify if the filter's clogging up. Um, but monitoring pressure is more complicated than it seems. And that's because, you know, a lot of these mechanical pressure gauges on an irrigation system are often inaccurate or they're in the wrong place or they're broken. And so even, you know, you could buy a, a new mechanical pressure gauge and we found that they can be inaccurate as much as one or two PSI, just right off the shelf, which can be a 10 or 20% error if your drip tape's at 10 PSI. So a few uh, practices that I use for monitoring pressure in drip systems that I found useful over the years. First is, you know, don't leave necessarily um, just pressure gauges on your drip system. Install Schrader valves. These are those little valves you see on bicycle tires, but you can buy these and um, uh, just put them in different locations on your drip system. So on the sub main, ends of drip tape, middle of the field. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then using what's called a Schrader adapter that you can put on to a, what you identify as an accurate mechanical gauge, uh, you use that for checking the pressure. So in essence, you're using the same pressure gauge in all different locations in your field. And so that's helping you take that variability out from pressure gauge to pressure gauge. You're always using the same pressure gauge. And then periodically, just check the calibration of your gauge. Um, and sometimes you'll find it's one or two PSI above or below a calibrated gauge. And so I just mark that on the gauge. And another uh, tip is you have to use a gauge that's in the right range of pressure or where you're checking the pressure. So right on the drip system, okay, it's going to be at low pressure. So you can use a zero to 15 or zero to 30 PSI range um, gauge. But if you're at the well, or at your pump, it may be a much higher pressure. So you need a gauge in that range. If you use the low range gauge in the high pressure area, you end up breaking or getting it out of calibration. So you really have to take care of your pressure gauges. They are more fragile than you might think. And so this is an example of Schrader valves that we put uh, in couplers. So we can measure the pressure in the field on the drip tape, um, or we might have uh, Schrader's right on the main line, or there's a riser where we can have a gauge or uh, right next to it with a T, we can add in a Schrader. And then periodically we check the calibration of our pressure gauges. And this is a simple way to do it is 
uh, from this company, Dwyer, you can buy these electronic gauges. And then I just take a piece of PVC, I cap it, you know, with put two caps on it, put in some Schrader valves, and I pump this up to different pressures. And then I can put my calibrated, um, my regular gauge and compare it with the calibrated gauge. So you can see in that picture to the right, uh, electronic ones showing 20 PSI and my um, uh, regular gauge, my mechanical one is also showing that. So then I know it is working correctly. Now, irrigators and many people try to regulate the pressure of the drip systems using a valve or a valve opener in this case. And the problem is, is if we have variation in pressure at the pump, then we get variation and uh, in the pressure in the drip system, you know, downstream. And this is an example we're monitoring the flow into a drip system during the day and uh, the flow rates going up and down and up and down it's really varying in the flow rate because the pressure is varying and that's because maybe maybe there's other blocks that are being opened and closed at this ranch and uh, the pressure is going up and down in the system so that is problematic and if you're trying to do any irrigation scheduling and you're doing it by hours, well, you really don't know how much water you're putting on per unit time. And just to show you how this um, really works over a season, here's a field that we were monitoring with a flow meter and then calculating the application rate, the average application rate for each irrigation from April uh, to uh, June. And you can see the application rates were varying tremendously, 33% uh, overall through uh, this cropping season. So the solution is, is using pressure regulation. And so there's lots of different types of mechanical uh, pressure regulators, and some of them called pressure regulating valves. Um, and some are adjustable. The ones on the left there, my screen, um, are actually uh, very useful because you just buy them at a set pressure that you want and they hold it there. So the Senninger ones, uh, the black and white one, uh, you can get them up to three inch diameters, I believe. And uh, the trick is you have to um, buy them for the range of flow rates that you're going to have in your drip system. So they're not very flexible. Once you once you buy them, you can't adjust them and they only work for a, ring, a small range of flow rates. The adjustable ones um, give you more flexibility, get different pressures, and they can handle a higher range of flow rates or a wider range of flow rates. And Work we've done uh, lately in just evaluating some of these different pressure regulator, regulators or regulating valves show like this one, which Nelson makes, uh, works very nicely. This one, this model, uh, you can buy it for two, three, or four inch diameter pipe. And then they have models that go all the way up to six or eight inches. But it can accommodate a wide range of flow rates and we found um, it's very easy to adjust the downstream pressure with them. And um, they really hold that pressure very consistently um, through uh, the irrigation and, and between irrigations. So uh, this slide's just showing you when we took um, one of those Nelson regulators and put it on the field, um, the the graph on the left is showing you how much variation you have with no regulation. But on the right, you're seeing with that valve, we go from 33% variation in the application rate down to 6%. So still a little variation, but very little compared to before. So those valves work very nicely. And once you have a very consistent application rate, it makes it much easier to do irrigation scheduling. So with that, I'm gonna talk just briefly about irrigation scheduling and, and what you're trying to do here. So this graph is showing you uh, cumulatively through the season, what is recommended 
um, in terms of water applications and through our monitoring uh, what the grower actually put on. And you see they're very close. So the grower was uh, doing a very good job. And this is actual data from, from one of the growers we work with, doing a very good job of matching its irrigations with the crop water requirements. And early in the season, usually the crop doesn't need a lot of water because it doesn't have a lot of canopy yet. So the transpiration rates are quite low. But later on, uh, that's when the water demand increases. And often what we see is growers over apply water for at least for vegetables early on, and then they under apply uh, later in the season. So they're not keeping up with the, the water demand. So there's various approaches uh, to doing irrigation scheduling, uh, weather-based or ET-based scheduling, plant-based and, and soil-based, looking at soil moisture. But um, flow meters are a very useful tool uh, for irrigation scheduling because that will give you the feedback of how much water you're actually applying and also help you determine if you've applied the right amount yet. So you can put, use uh, a flow meter on your, your pump or you can put them on uh, individual irrigation blocks. We um, often interface them with data loggers so we can monitor uh, without being there how much water is being applied and, and also look at the flow rates. Uh, so I can give you data like you, you just saw previously. So with weather-based irrigation scheduling, we're relying on uh, weather data. And in California, we get that from the California Irrigation Management and Information System. It's uh, free and it's online. It's operated by the Department of Water Resources. And that, um, you know, you look up on their website for a weather station that's near your, uh, your farm, and uh, you can get a reference evapotranspiration number um, and it would be a daily evapotranspiration number. Then you have to adjust it for a crop coefficient to reflect um, sort of the, the canopy cover of your crop. And it will increase as that canopy increases to get to a maximum. And for most vegetables, uh, you harvest it when you're at maximum canopy. If you're talking about agronomic crops, um, there's a senescent period. And so they start, um, the, the crop coefficient decreases later in the season. Well, we knew that um, not many people were taking advantage of using uh, weather-based irrigation scheduling from the SIM system. So we developed, um, as, as Parna talked earlier, this uh, online decision support tool called Crop Manage. So what that will do is automate uh, all those calculations for you and actually give you a recommendation in terms of hours of how long you should operate your irrigation system. And we have it for a number of different row crops and vegetables. And just to show you what that looks like, you know, you set up an irrigation event and you just have to tell it what day and the irrigation method you want to use and you get a recommendation either in inches or in hours. And if you want to see how it came up with that recommendation, um, you hit clicked on, you click on this recommendation summary and then um, all the information that it's using is revealed and you see the average ET here is eight hundredths of an inch a day. The average crop coefficient since the last irrigation is 0.9. And then we have a distribution uniformity. That's your application uniformity in there. And it knows how many days since your last irrigation. Um, you can have a leaching requirement and it subtracts us off for any precipitation that occurred. So that crop manage is quite useful in figuring out how much water to apply. It's always tricky sometimes to figure out when to irrigate, especially in more deeper rooted crops that um, have access to uh, more moisture. So you can, of course, use a soil probe and that works really nicely. Uh, but um, 
a lot of people like to use soil moisture sensors. And there's two um, sort of classes of sensors that are available. One's, there's some that are tension based. And so it's looking at um, the soil dryness based on how likely it is to pull moisture um, from the soil or how, likely, how hard it is for a plant to pull moisture from the soil with its roots. And then volumetric is just the uh, volume of the soil that's occupied uh, by water. So I like using tension-based uh, methods in vegetables because it simulates more what the plant is seeing and it's more independent of the soil texture because in a sandy soil, you might find you know the water holding capacity at maximum is maybe 15%. But in a clay soil, it could be 35%. So you're never sure what the volumetric measurements really telling you in terms of how much water you can extract before um, the, the plant's experiencing stress. But with tension, a higher number means the plant is having a harder time pulling the water from the soil. And so it, whether you're in a sandy soil or, or a um, clay soil or a silt soil, um, the number that you get with a with a tension based uh, sensor <laughs> is very consistent. And um, we've also uh, been looking at tensiometers, so to measure tension, soil moisture tension, and in terms of you know getting ones that operate well. And I'm always trying to find ones that are inexpensive and accurate. And finally, we we just developed a very simple way that you can build your own. Uh, it's just out of PVC and you buy this ceramic cup at the bottom of that tensiometer there. And that's the part that allows water to move in and out of the tensiometer. Um, and when the water moves out, because the soil is drier, it creates a vacuum. And so you have this vacuum gauge and that's why you know, a higher number indicates drier conditions because as that water moves out, creates a vacuum, um, you're reading a higher vacuum pressure. So drier soil is like a sponge. It, it's going to pull the water out of the tensiometer. So if you want to learn more, you know, how to make these, uh, I did put a QR code there. You can take a picture with your phone there. Okay. Um, so just to summarize, you know, achieving a high irrigation efficiency can maximize your yield and quality of your uh, crop, as well as save water, fertilizer, and money. And both application uniformity of your drip system and the scheduling affects irrigation efficiency. There's the design, operation, and maintenance of the irrigation system is going to affect how uniformly the drip tape applies water to the crop. And you can use tools such as flow meters or moisture sensors, uh, the crop managed decision support uh, tool that's online, as well as calibrated pressure gauges uh, to help you assess if you're applying water uniformly and matching the irrigation applications with your crop needs. So with that, um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions and we can, have a discussion.